Good afternoon, everyone, and Happy New Year. We are so delighted that you have tuned in to join us today. We see people are still coming in from all over, and we're excited to have you. Welcome to Thursdays for the Soul. I am Reverend Tracy Blackman, Associate General Minister of Justice and Local Church Ministries for the United Church of Christ. And Thursdays for the Soul is a webinar series for the entire church. We faithfully focus on care and education for the people of God and create opportunities to digitally worship together as the whole of the United Church of Christ. From prayer, music and songs to interviews of key leaders and how to's in congregational life. This series stays current to the relevant topics of the world toward the world God imagines for all of us. We have many upcoming sessions that you may be interested in. Next Thursday, we will entertain conversation about the UCC ethnic and congregations of color in rural communities. And the following Thursday, we will discuss our whole lives and sexuality and our faith, dismantling shame and stigma about bodies and relationships. You can always sign up to receive notification of what's coming next, but I want to get into the conversation we're going to have today. Today, we are fortunate enough to have with us Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III, who has just released his newest book, Dancing in the Darkness. I am so excited about this book. It's a life affirming guide to the practical, political and spiritual challenges of our day. And I'm doubly excited because as you know, Reverend Dr. Otis Moss is a part of the United Church of Christ and also one of our co-leaders for our Join the Movement campaign that we have going on currently. So today I want to dive just straight in because I know people will have questions. Uh, people are already signing up. Uh, people have their hands raised and we haven't even started. So I'm really excited about this. And it's not lost on me, Dr. Moss, that we are having this conversation on the eve of the anniversary of the January 6th insurrection. It's not lost on me that you have released a book about hope and how to see the world differently, even in challenging times, how to see our opportunities differently as we also are called to remember what happened just a few years ago when people led with hatred instead of hope. It is also not lost on me that we're having this conversation as we are watching the debacle in the house play out when power is more important than people. And so I'm honored to be in this space with you today to learn a little bit more about dancing in the darkness. I noticed in the introduction of this book, which is done by uh, one of my favorite people, uh, he talks about, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson talks about this mentality about reacting to our circumstances in ways that bring the best out of us. And he uses an old analogy that I've heard over and over again uh, about the carrot, the egg, and the coffee bean. And all of them being put in hot water respond differently to that water, right? Uh, so the carrot gets soft, the egg gets hard, the coffee bean changes the environment. And he uses this analogy to talk about this sense that many people, particularly in black culture have about changing the environment when we're in hot water. And he alludes to your upbringing, your shaping, your forming, and your continuation of this legacy of changing the negative environments that we're in. I want to talk with you a little bit about how this ethos guided you in the writing of this book. Mm. Well, Reverend, Reverend Tracy, first, I want to say, say thank you. Uh, thank you to you for, for your witness. Uh, for your friendship and what you mean, not only to uh, the United Church of Christ, uh, but what you mean across this nation. Your voice uh, has been echoing from Maine to California as a citadel of, of hope 
and also of critique and helping us become uh, the yet to be, in the words of W.E.B. Du Bois, Uni uh, United States of America. And it's just a privilege uh, to call you my sister. I tease you often. Uh, and I just so appreciate you. And I'm so appreciative to be a part of the United Church of, of Christ. <laughs> I am I'm grateful uh, for, you know, Dyson uses this, this idea of the, the, the coffee bean, which I think is, is a perfect uh, image uh, metaphor to speak about when I talk about black spirituality, this, this, this idea uh, that we are called to uh, be change agents, that we're called to, to transform. And so my family, for those who may, may not know, I was raised in a very wonderful and unique household. Uh, my father, uh, was the uh, one of the architects and leaders of what was known as the uh, Atlanta Student Student Sit-in Movement, uh, that was also known as the uh, uh, the Movement for Human Rights in in 1956, uh, along with uh, James Orange, along with um, Marion Wright Edelman, uh, along with there's a variety of people who were a part of of that group. He later joined the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, became a board member and a lieutenant, where he met my mother who was the office manager in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC. Mm -hmm. uh, so I always joke and say, because uh, Dr. King performed the wedding nuptials for my parents, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Dr. King. Uh, <laughs> but I was raised in a household that was rooted in this, this Black spirituality. When I say Black spirituality, I mean that it brings together the, the Southern wisdom and tradition, the, uh, the griot pattern of, of West Africa. It's a, it's a creolized cultural, spiritual narrative. In many ways, it's jazz. And uh, it's mixed in with an embodiment Christianity. Uh, not not evangelical, an embodiment Christianity that really comes out of the Orthodox, the Ethiopian Orthodox uh, tradition uh, that says we are called to do the dance and the work of God through our actions. And if our dance is beautiful enough, someone might inquire, how'd you learn how to dance? And you might say, oh, I met this guy named Jesus, but even not, um, you still do the dance and it beautifies everything around you. So I always thought everybody in church uh, was, was called to help transform a community. I didn't know anything about evangelicalism, white evangelicalism. I didn't know anything about denominations. I really thought there was like, there's some black folk over here and there's some white folk over there. Um, and until I got to college, I found out that there were all these people that had these peculiar doctrinal framings about you going to hell, uh, you need to know what we know. I was like, who are you people? You know, I was like, I was really confused because I was in such an interdenominational, ecumenical community where for my father's um, anniversary, uh, church anniversary, uh, his, his preaching anniversary, we'd have an imam and, and a rabbi. We'd have someone who was Pentecostal, a Pentecostal bishop, uh, along with a person who was from the UCC church. And I just thought that was normal. I thought that's the way that you were supposed to operate. And we were always raising the question in our home church, what are you called to do to change the world for those who have not yet been born? My father always says, what will you leave? What imprint will be placed upon this earth that will bless those who are not yet born? And so that was, that was the spirituality that I came out of. Mm -hmm. And it is the rue. Uh, that is a part of this book that I wanted to be able to share that there is a tradition, there is a framework, uh, there is uh, a path and a practice uh, that is not found on certain networks and uh, not found uh, in certain corners of, of the internet that has been thriving since the moment people arrived on these shores in 1619. Frederick Douglass is a part of this tradition. Sojourner Truth is a part of this tradition. Ida B. Wells is a part of this tradition. Joanne Robinson, who I hope to tell that story a little bit later, one of my favorite uh, heroes along with Fannie Lou Hamer, is a part of this tradition. And we have to reclaim this incredibly powerful, hopeful, critiquing, truthful, respectful, lovely dancing uh, tradition uh, that is unafraid of tragedy, but refuses to fall into despair.
I really like that. Um, you, you began this journey with us by sharing with us a letter mm. that you wrote to your son. Um, and an unfortunate letter that I want you to, to talk about, but a necessary letter mm. for many. Um, you began talking about this letter that I read as an anchor for why this book is necessary. Can you share a little bit about your conversation with mm. your son? Well, I, I thank you for, for lifting that up. The, the, the letter that, that, that begins the book uh, and, and, and anchors and is a bookend uh, actually in the book was a letter that I wrote to my son when he was younger, when he had witnessed the, uh, the broadcast death of Philando Castile. And he raised the question to me, dad, am I next? And I had to have, I'd had conversations with, with Elijah, who now is about to uh, graduate from Morehouse, by the way. Yay! Uh, yes, that was yes. fast. He, he will graduate in May. In. And he will probably graduate summa cum laude. We're very proud of him. Uh, he's, doing, he's doing quite well. And he's in Ireland right now studying uh, the footsteps of Frederick Douglass when he visited Ireland uh, in 1846 with a group of Morehouse students. So I, I just got to give a shout out uh, to him. And we had this conversation. Every Black father has to have this conversation with their son. Uh, the conversation that... Uh, people will not see you as a frolicking teenager. Uh, they will not give you the benefit of the doubt. And because of the beauty of your blackness, uh, people will weaponize the melanin uh, because of their melanin phobia uh, upon you. And so let me share with you, Elijah, there's nothing wrong with you, number one. There's something wrong with them. Don't, don't, in, don't take, don't drink from what they are trying to force down your, your throat. Mm -hmm. And that you and your friends and your generation, you, you really are the, not only the future, but you are the hope of this nation, of what we can be. And I wanted to say as a father to him, I want to tell him the truth. I want to share the, uh, the necessary virtues that he has to hold on to in order to thrive in, in this fragile democracy, this struggling republic, this community, this nation that loves to live in myth and possibility at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a conversation that every Black parent has to have. And I believe if you are a father and a Black father, it is your spiritual duty to have this conversation with your son and with your daughter. And in that moment, I had to have it with my son because of the death that he was witnessing publicly on his social media feed. I, I like that. And every once in a while, I'm going to slip and say, oh, this because that's how we talk. So I'm going to say, um, I want to lean into it a little bit um, because you allude in the book to some of the reactions that you received when you shared this letter you had written with your son, right? Um, and, and, you know, quite frankly, on different levels at this particular time in our society, we may not always be the only ones that have to have these conversations now. Parents of trans children are having to have these conversations. Mm. Parents mm. of gay children are mm. having to have these conversations. Mm. Parents of immigrants, because mm. of the proliferation of hatred coming in, are having to have conversations that anchor their children in, you are not what people say you are. You're not who people say you are, right? And so talk a little bit about the necessity of such truth, mm. if we're ever going to get to triumph. Mm. You know, the uh, scriptures talks about then you should know the truth and the truth will set you free. When we arm our children uh, with truth mm -hmm. rooted in love, mm -hmm. we place armament around them. We give them armor to be able to handle the world. There's nothing more dangerous than a child who has been lied to all of their life. And they all of a sudden then run into the truth 
when they're an adult, uh, but when they are young and we share with them that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you are a creation of God. There is something I said last, uh, last week for our uh, New Year's Eve service that really applies and, and connects to this. I was talking about the fact that uh, the name of the title of the sermon was like at war with myself. And we were talking about there'll be preachers on New Year's Eve, as you know, uh, Rev, that somebody's gonna be like, you're stepping into your new season. It's manifestation, blessing after blessing after blessing. I said that any blessing has a, con has a conjunction next to it, that there is nothing that you will move into uh, until there's, a, there's an until next to it until you deal with yourself. And I said, one of the things that we must deal with is that we must learn to find our Boudini and reclaim our Douglas. I didn't say Houdini, I said Boudini. Okay. Um, okay. Drew Boudini Brown was the corner man for a person by the name of Cassius Clay. And he could not teach you how to fight and he could not fix a cut on your, above your eye, he couldn't tell you how to train. He said, but my job is to remind you, you are the greatest. And whenever you come into this corner, he would whisper into Cassius Clay's ear, don't you forget who you are. You can float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. And Cassius Clay, who becomes Muhammad Ali, says that I was able to defeat Sonny Liston because fear was overtaking me when I stepped in the ring. I stopped believing I had the power to win, but it was my corner man who told me, get back in there and remember who you are. So yeah. one of the things that parents were called to do, we're called to be Boudinis for our children. Mm -hmm. The other aspect is reclaim your Douglas. Mm -hmm. The powerful thing, I've been reading a lot about Douglas. I'm a big Douglas fan, okay? I, I love some Frederick Douglas. That, that brother is on another level, okay? Um, and so I found out that Douglas says, and I'm paraphrasing, he said one of the most dangerous things that the enslaver did uh, that he should not have done uh, for me is that when, he, when I learned how to read and I learned how to read what was in the Bible instead of someone telling me what was there. Yeah. And when I found out what was in there, he said, then I realized I am a child of God. Mm -hmm. Once I connected to the fact that I am a child of God, that theology, that spirituality changed his life. It changed his life to the point where he went back after running away for a few hours. He went back to the overseer who was trying to whip him. He took the whip from the man and beat him for two hours in the shed and said, don't you ever try that again. You know, <laughs> I mean, this, is, this man was on a different level, but he says, once he knew, and he had an encounter in the woods with a preacher who reminded him, you're a child of God. And so it changes his life because he had reclaimed that very sacred idea. When we are called to be the corner men and women, the Boudinis for this generation, mm -hmm. we are also called to help them reclaim their Douglas in other words, recognizing that they're children of God. So, th so this, what you are, are articulating, what you articulate here is um, a hidden power mm -hmm. <laughs> that mm -hmm. we as, not just as parents, but as teachers, as preachers, mm -hmm. as lay people, I can't even, I can't even name all the people who have spoken into my life from different places and reminded me who I am. Uh, I wanna remind people that you can put questions in the chat. Some of them I will get to and some that I won't. So just uh, know that. But Nancy has asked a question. I don't want her to be stuck there because other people may be as well. You mentioned the Christianity of the Ethiopian church. Hmm? And she's asking, what the embodied Christianity of the Ethiopian church entails. Mm. Oh, that's a wonderful thing. So we, in 2017, we, we took a trip to, to Ethiopia and Trinity is very much connected to the, the Ethiopian tradition. Matter of fact, we got a big Ethiopian cross, right? <laughs> right in our church. Um, in the Ethiopian tradition, there is no, what you would consider to be the uh, practice of evangelism. Nobody's going around passing tracks. And then they have also no reference to Western Christianity. This is the other funny thing. If you ask them about a Pope, they look at you like, you talking about ours? 
You know, it's like, what are you talking about? Um, they, they, they get really confused because they've never been colonized. Mm -hmm. And in their tradition, they believe in embodiment, meaning that I am to embody Christ in my actions, in my speech, in my life. So I don't go and knock on the door and say, will you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior? What I do is I live a life where you then want to inquire why you lived in the manner which you do. And even if you don't choose to follow in that manner, they believe that it's my job to embody. And as I embody, you will be blessed by my embodiment. And I will be blessed by the embodiment because I'm called to beautify no matter what. And so the American idea is about market and numbers. Guess what? We saved so many people. Guess what? So many people came to Christ. In the Ethiopian idea is that today, did you beautify the world that God has given us? It's a very different way. It's a very different, different way of framing. Yes, uh, and a very important distinction about what matters. Mm -hmm. uh, in this book, Dancing in the Darkness, you have this delightful story. You and I talked about it a little bit last night about uh, waking up and your children, your son and your daughter in a brand new house uh, have been downstairs in the basement, beautifying it, as you want to say. Um, and there's paint everywhere on the walls. Mm -hmm. um, and you talk in this, in this chapter about learning how to consecrate chaos. Mm. Right? Um, I want you to talk a little bit about that chapter and about your response to what happened there. Well, I, I appreciate you bringing, bringing that one up because uh, my, my initial reaction uh, that my son and my daughter and the dog, Mateo, I uh, had decided that they were going to redecorate the basement. I forgot about the dog. The dog was really <laughs> again. Yeah, and go ahead. Paul prints everywhere. And um, here I am. I'm upset. You know, it's like, y'all, and it's like, I was like, I was really worried. It's like, Monica's coming home. I'm, oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm watching the kids. And um, I said, and we just moved in the house. And, and they kept saying, look, dad, look, dad, look what we did. And it took me a minute. I had to pause in the midst of that chaos, I saw it first, nothing but you have messed up the walls <laughs> in the basement. But the spirit was saying, you need to pause in the midst of this chaos. And can you see the pattern and the beauty in this chaos? Mm -hmm. And in that chapter, I'm attempting, I'm telling stories and, and start to talk about Black Lives Matter. And those who are sailors and sail understand this, is that people who sail, people who are connected to nature, understand that chaos is a part of sailing, and chaos is a part of farming. Chaos is a part of all of these things if you're any, any type of connection with creation. And, but there are certain patterns. Uh, there are certain laws. So if you're sailing, uh, you don't sail in a direct line. You have to tack left and right. You have something that is below the water, uh, this rudder, uh, and you have this keel that is keeping you balanced and you have to learn how to utilize those things. Mm -hmm. BLM took a phone and in the chaos of all of this weaponization of people of color, they're, they're, of, of our skin and police brutality, they found a way to extend a sail so that we could begin to organize together. And we have to find moments where you pause in chaos. And I, I'm a basketball head. I love basketball. And when you play basketball, you learn how to slow the game down. When you become you know, very proficient with the game, great players slow it down. Literally, they say that they're able to pause and they're able to see multiple ways to deal with the opponent in front of them. One of the most famous and iconic moments in basketball is when Michael Jordan goes up for a layup with his right hand and in midair switches to his left. They interview him and say, well, I paused in the air. I saw what the opponent was going to do and that I had another opportunity on the left. This is the same type of spiritual principle that we're to use in the world today. 
pausing and silence and taking moments instead of allowing the chaos to control us, finding the pattern that can be used so that we can extend our sale. I have so much I want to talk to you about about that because it stimulates so much in me. Um, the thing that's right on top for me is how as I was reading this chapter and get to the part where you see the beauty in the chaos, I was reminded of the dissonance that sometimes exists in movements now, mm. right? Mm. The, the old way versus the new way. Mm -hmm the songs versus the chant, mm -hmm. the getting in the face of people versus uh, keeping your eyes straight ahead and not responding at mm -hmm. all. Um, and I'm wondering, um, as we go through these generational uh, shifts, might we learn something if we could just look beyond the chaos of the moment? Mm. and see the beauty that is being created in the resistance in all of its, all of its times. I wanna talk about that a little bit with you. And the other thing that comes up for me is I can't remember what chapter it is, Otis, but you talk about, I believe it's Thurman that sits mm. in the silence. Is mm. it Thurman? Yes, Thurman. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, who, from whom you give us a guide of how to sit in silence until we are prepared to move. Yeah, Can you talk about a little bit the connections there? Yeah, yeah. One of the things, uh, and I just, these, the book is full of stories. Um, when we would go on trips uh, in the summertime with my parents as a family, uh, my father always had Thurman tapes with him and he would put in Thurman tapes. And that's one of the ways that uh, I developed an appreciation for Howard Thurman. But what was fascinating to me at first, he used to annoy me because I was like, is he ever going to talk? I was like, he's like, you, all this silence, what is this silence? But then I, I recognized and in conversation with my mother, uh, understood saying that people are uncomfortable with silence. And the moment you can become comfortable, we always talk about an uncomfortable silence. Mm -hmm. um, that, but when you become comfortable in the moment of silence, that is the moment when you can hear the spirit speak. That whether you are in sports or you're an artist, um, whether you are, whatever it may be, you will notice that people who are really at the top of their game, they find these spaces to be silent. Mm -hmm. So Howard Thurman, and I'm reminded, let me give a Thurman story. I got, I got a good one for you here. So, uh, so, so Thurman was speaking at uh, an HBCU. I'm not sure which one it was. Um, and he came in, it was this talking to the freshman class and they're introducing him that here is Dr. Howard Thurman, a great theologian, mystic, you know, philosopher and all of this. Mm -hmm. the students didn't want to hear some preacher. This is a time period when, you know, students did not want to hear from the preachers. They had this great critique of the church. And so Thurman, as the students were being rowdy, he turns his back on the students. And there is a stained glass painting of, of Jesus on the cross. And he pauses for about three minutes. Then he begins to point at the stained glass and says, I know how you felt. And he begins to preach to the stained glass. The students get quiet and then weeping begins. And he never turned back around. <laughs> he continued to preach to the stained glass about the trepidations and challenges of when you serve that which is greater than you. And then he left. They say that, this, and I've heard this story over and over again by people who either heard it or were there, and they said that they had never been moved so deeply by a preacher is they were moved by Howard Thurman when he didn't preach at us, but he preached to the stained glass imagery of Jesus. The power of silence, the power of pausing in the midst of what can be a chaotic situation he found a need that those students had and they needed the kind of spiritual direction 
that they didn't even realize that they needed at, at, at that moment. And that's something that we're missing today. We, 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 there's an itch that everybody's trying to scratch that money and social media and algorithms just will not feel. We have an anemic spirit in America and there is a deep need for, for people who are committed to these principles and committed to a deep spirituality that's not shallow uh, mm -hmm. to make their voices known in the public square. I'm just sitting with that story because it's so powerful. Um, you're, you know, I like your preaching, Otis, but your father does that to me. <laughs> your Pop, father, is, he, he, Pop is a master. <laughs> I cannot listen to him preach without weeping. He has that impact on me. Uh, Arthur Butler, who's joining us today, asked the question, can you speak to the opportunity that is in chaos? Mm, mm. You know, that, for example, if, and like I said, I, I'm sorry, I, I speak in stories of it very often. Um, let us take the chaotic moment of Mamie Till. Mm -hmm. Mamie Till has what every parent would say was probably the most horrific moment that you could encounter. Not only was your son killed, but your son was tortured, lynched, and then his body cast away like an old tin can in a river. And she made a decision in that chaos. And the story is that she literally paused and she, she prayed in the demand for the casket to be open. There is a, uh, he's not, since passed away, we had a member at our church who served as as security for that uh, homegoing service in Chicago. And he talked about the power of the open casket and the spirituality of Mamie Till mm -hmm. and what she did with her presence and what she did by taking what should have been a chaotic moment should have broken her and turned it into a moment that helped even catapult more people into the movement. Um, we have to have time to pause to handle opportunities in chaos. And they, they, they come about all the time if we are in the practice of pausing and listening and gathering ourselves, we can witness chaos, whether you're playing basketball, whether you're playing football, what, whatever it is, whether you are pastoring, whether you are painting, whatever it may do, or the creation of a poem, or do what Wendell Pierce did when someone interrupted him, the death of a salesman, mm -hmm. to, to use that moment as a teaching moment for everyone who has showed up at the theater. My, the, my, the best example I could give you is, is Wynton Marcellus. This is one of my favorite stories about Wynton Marcellus. So Wynton Marcellus was having kind of a, you know, kind of a down year, uh, according to one writer from the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Atlantic magazine. Mm -hmm. And he had been kind of just kind of going through the motions a lot of times when he was playing. Wynton Marcellus, one of the great jazz trumpeters. He was playing at the Village Vanguard, I believe. Mm -hmm. And he seemed to have gotten his groove back. He had, was presenting some new music and then was playing a classic. I believe the classic was Cherokee. And he was doing his solo. He was killing it, Tracy. He was killing it. And then someone on the front row, their cell phone goes off in the middle of the solo. And the Vanguard is extremely small. Mm -hmm. And the writer who was reviewing wrote on his nap napkin, magic gone. So the man gets up with the phone, walks out in front of Wynton Marcellus. People are upset. And then Wynton does something that was magical. He begins to play in his solo the tone of the cell phone. He begins to play the, the sounds of the cell phone. And everybody in the midst of this chaotic moment come back to center. And then everyone who witnessed that concert said that might have been the greatest trumpet solo they had ever witnessed in their life. Mm -hmm. The interruption that was chaotic gave an opportunity to present something new as the spirit of God was moving in the midst of an improvisational moment. Yes. And 
and a faithful reminder to us that God is no stranger to chaos. Mm, that's right. Um, God is no stranger to chaos. So I think I should say, you said it, but I'm talking because I've read the book. The book just came out yesterday um, and it is a compilation of stories. So I have questions here. People are saying they want their son, um, Janice is saying she wants her son who is a sailor to learn from these illustrations. Is mm -hmm. this in the book? Mm -hmm. Everything we're saying here is not in the book, mm -hmm. but everything we're saying here is in the book. It's in the book, right? yeah. <laughs> So it's in different stories where uh, Otis has a unique gift to see through stories, the meaning of, of the deeper meaning of what is happening in life. And so I don't, if you know me at all, you know I don't recommend things that I don't believe in, but I do, I do recommend that you get this book. Um, and it's a very small book uh, that you will read over and over again as I will. There's a question here from Penny Phillips who asks, how can we reclaim Christianity from those Christians who are on a different wavelength within what they call Christianity? Um, and if it's okay with you, I'm just gonna answer that question because I don't feel that it is our role to try to reclaim Christianity. Mm -hmm. Christianity has not changed no matter what people call it. And so this whole conversation we're having about embodiment is what we are to do. We don't have to fight against anything. Mm -hmm. We have to stand for who we are. And the reclamation for me, at least, is within us to remember who we are and what we stand for. The rest will take care of itself. I mm -hmm. know it doesn't feel like that because mm -hmm. the chaos gets us distracted, right? But one of the largest mistakes we are making as believers, as people of God, is to waste our energy mm. talking about what we are against versus living our lives in an embodied way that magnifies who we are and what we're for. Um, you want to add something to that? I, th I, th I think you hit it. I, I would... Uh, maybe 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 put it put it this way also to add with what you say because I completely agree. Um, if Grandmama makes some good peach cobbler, we really don't need to reclaim it. Uh, we just need to keep on making it and serving it. Yeah. Uh, so so make your cobbler, make your pie, create your cornbread, and there are people who will make stuff that's artificial down the street. But no, the good home stuff is being made and being served in the backyard at the church fellowship, uh, at the picnic, uh, and, and keep on serving what is good. And eventually the savory smell will attract some other folk to show up to the house. Hmm. Uh, so there, there's another question here. Can you speak more about spiritual formation and ministerial formation in light of embodiment? Mm, mm. So, that's a wonderful question because one of the things, um, you know, in this kind of uh, Ethiopian Orthodox tradition, uh, in in the tradition of of of, of black spirituality that, that that we come from, Tracy, is the necessity of mentorship uh, mm -hmm. and finding good mentorship, and those mentors are not necessarily always ministers, but they minister too. Yeah. Um, one of the, the greatest mentors for my father was a woman by the name of Esther Smith. Actually, mm -hmm. everybody called her Queen Esther Smith. Uh, she, was the fo she formed the New Era Progressive Convention in Georgia. And because of patriarchy, you know, she was discouraged from becoming a minister. Um, but she was an absolute utter authority on, old, on the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So my father and other ministers at ITC would bring their sermons before they preach them to Esther Smith. And she would say, hmm, well, the, your translation from Hebrew, you ain't, Otis, you ain't got it right here. You need to read this over here. Oh, and you stole this from someone else, didn't you? Because I've heard this story. You need to, you need to cite so-and-so. I mean, <laughs> she was 
a brilliant mind and would have been would have been a professor or a preacher somewhere else. But here is this this elder who is shaping this new generation in the in the 50s and the 60s, um, how to preach in an embodied way. And one of the things that she said, she said, it's said anybody can hear a sermon, but can you be one? Can you live it? And she was always pushing them to, to race and, and, and a name that no one, not many people know. Um, and so finding those people in your life becomes important uh, who you trust and you can take their counsel. And we, we've kind of left that uh, aside, the, the kind of, of mentorship uh, that, that really blessed uh, blessed people in unique ways. I'm reminded of J. Alfred Smith, um, West Coast. J. Yeah. Alfred Smith will call myself and Monica out of the blue. I mean, it's like it's 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 like you're getting a call from God or something. You know, J. Alfred Smith will call and said, "I'm just calling," and he talks his way to pray with you. And he does these prayers. He says, "Monica, what should I pray for? Otis, what should I?" And he prays. And then he says, bye bye. And we may not hear from him from another like another year. Um, but that kind of spirituality we have to reclaim and build those kinds of relationships with people. I've had that experience with Jay Alfred. That's how <laughs> I met him. I didn't know him at all. And he called me out of the blue and told me who he was and said, I'm just calling to pray for you. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, those, mm. those moments matter. Iris Cumberbatch says something uh, in the chat that I want to repeat because I think it's really powerful. She says, I am reminded of a JF Kennedy quote. The Chinese use two brush strokes to write the word crisis. One brush stroke stands for danger, the other for opportunity. In a crisis, be aware of the danger, but recognize the opportunity. Yes. And, and that's really what this book is about. You talk about many uh, incidences, many challenges, many obstacles that are faced and model for us ways to see beyond that to the deeper meaning and opportunity of the moment. These times are never long enough. And I want to make sure I get to my favorite story. I would ask you what your favorite story is, but that might mean I don't get to my favorite story. So we're just <laughs> going to talk about my favorite story, uh, which is the other bookend of this book. Mm -hmm. And uh, I surmise where the title of the book came from. Um, and it is uh, recalling a moment with your daughter mm -hmm. in 2008. Uh, at a time when things were troubling, to say the least, mm -hmm. in Trinity, because there was this rambunctious young man running for president of the United States, and lots of things happened out of that, um, that caused danger and fear to come to your church, to come to the doors of the church. Um, that was not your fault, and it wasn't the fault of your predecessor. It's mm -hmm. what hate does, right? Um, but yet you have to live in that moment. And so I love about this story um, that while you are occupied with trying to protect your family and make sure that they're safe, um, while you are doing that, that, um, well, you tell the story because now I'm confused. I see two Dr. Mosses on the screen right now. I think now. that's Melody who popped up in here. I think that hey, uh, my, my office there. I think. I don't know. They're not being Mon they may be I'm, Monica. I'm not sure. I'm just as confused. I did pop up on here and I saw my name came up as Otis Moss. I'm so sorry. I didn't I didn't know. It's that all was good. You, you're all loved all the time. <laughs> okay. can, you, can you talk to us a little bit about that story? Uh, yes, indeed. It was, as you mentioned, in 2008 when uh, Senator Barack Obama was was running for president, now, now President Obama. Um, and as a result of that, uh, I was pastor at the church at the time, uh, Dr. Jeremiah Wright. Uh, my predecessor had already retired, was was gone, was out of the country, uh, actually. And I was in I was working out one, one evening doing my warm down. 
And I was on a treadmill and someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, Rev, is that your church on the news up there? And I looked up and there was Sean Hannity going off. I mean, straight up off. I was like, oh gosh, I gotta leave. And so there began going through the gauntlet of 40 outlets every single Sunday showing up outside of our church, putting microphones in the face of any member they could give, uh, get to make a comment. Uh, and then that's when the death threats began, where mm -hmm. against Dr. Wright, against myself, against the church. Uh, it was even to the point where we would have people during our altar call, we would we, we come to the altar and we kneel at the altar, uh, many people pre, pre, uh, prior to COVID. And there were people that would have tape recorders trying to secretly interview or get clips that would then show up on these conservative websites. I mean, it was, it was an absolute mess. So I had security, Dr. Wright had security. We had bomb sniffing dogs that would show up at every single service. Mm -hmm. And, you know, wherever I went, there was always, I was always shadowed by somebody. And then my children had to have security um, outside of their school and all of that. So one night um, we were asleep. Well, really, I, I didn't sleep much at all. I was completely frazzled. And was really even questioning, you know, you know, you know, God, why, why I need to leave ministry. I need to go and do something else completely. And um, I dozed off for a minute and Monica tapped me and said, I just heard something. You need to go check it out. I said, all right. So I grabbed my rod and my staff that comforts me, uh, that being a Louisville <laughs> slugger, um, and start walking around the house. And I heard the noise again uh, coming from my daughter's room. And I go into my daughter's room and there she is in the middle of the darkness. She's dancing, spinning around saying, look, daddy, look, daddy, I'm dancing. Pigtails flipping around and whatnot. And I'm, you know, I'm tired. And I said, baby, you need to get into bed. And that's when the spirit spoke and said, look at your daughter. She's dancing in the dark, all this darkness around her, but it's not, it's not in her. And I scrapped my sermon for that morning because it was, a, it was a Saturday night. It was really Sunday morning at that time. And I just wrote some notes that I, you know, I could write as fast as I could. Light came up and I was like, oh, I got to change and go to church. And that's when I stood before the congregation and told them that we are called to dance in the dark. As the scripture says in the psalmist, in the Psalms, you've turned my morning into dancing. And if we reclaim our dance, though it is dark, the sun shall rise, not because the sun is hidden, but because the earth has just rotated and eventually it will turn again and we shall dance. So, and so I talked about reclaiming the dance for our democracy, reclaiming the dance so that we can uh, pass and uh, lay to rest this thing called white supremacy, lay to rest these things that keep us from flourishing as human beings, that we need to learn how to dance again in the dark. And our ancestors knew how to dance. Harriet had a dance. Sojourner had a dance. Frederick had a dance. Ida B. Wells had, all of our ancestors knew how to dance. And here we are at this moment, you know, bemoaning the fact. And we come from a tradition of great spiritual dancers. So let us, let us reclaim that power. Yes, yes, that is beautiful. There's a question about where else will your book be launched? Uh, and I know there's a long list. I don't know all of it. I know that <laughs> there is a in-person launch in Cleveland mm -hmm. uh, that the United Church of Christ will also be a part of, along with your father's former church that he mm -hmm. pastored. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and other places that people can hear you? Absolutely. Uh, we're very excited to, there's a wonderful partnership with the Maltz Museum of, of Jewish History in, in Beachwood, Ohio. They currently have a, a series, a photography series of these amazing civil rights photographers uh, who captured incredible moments during the freedom movement. And they dedicated uh, this uh, this entire piece to my father. And then they also have at the museum, they have an AI version of my father, where you can actually ask him questions about the movement and all of these things. And he'll talk right back to you. It's, it's pretty amazing. So on the 16th of January, 
uh, we will have an in-person conversation and book signing at the Maltz Museum. So for those who are in Cleveland, we want to invite you to come on out. You have to see this exhibit. Uh, and one of the most moving things, because we're, we're actually working on a documentary on my father, um, is my mother and father were walking through the exhibit and they were looking at the pictures and <laughs> this is what your parents do to you sometimes. They were in the picture. They were not in the picture, but they were right outside the frame. Said, oh, I remember when that picture was taken. I was in the room with Coretta. That's what my mom said. I was like, you were there? Right, you know, like after Dr. King was assassinated? Yeah, this, this, is, this picture was taken and she gave the whole information. And she said, the photographer, that was our wedding photographer. So the pictures that you're seeing are also from our wedding photographer. And I'm like, why don't y'all tell me stuff? It's like, it's like, you all got all this information. Um, so the Maltz Museum, in, in Cleveland. Also, the Olivet Institutional Baptist Church will be doing a, a virtual conversation with, and um, that's my home church uh, that is now under the leadership of an amazing Morehouse uh, brother by the name of Jawan Zakolvin. Um, we'll be also on the 16th. Uh, we, will be, we will be there. We'll also uh, be uh, at Georgetown University. Uh, teach the speech at Georgetown University is a really wonderful program where I have the opportunity to really talk about Dr. King and frame one of his speeches and really break down what he meant and was attempting to do for, for American society. I'll be at Ebenezer Baptist Church uh, next week for their conference of uh, ending mass incarceration. And uh, we'll also be doing a book signing there in, in, in Atlanta. Uh, we'll be in uh, Macon, Georgia at Mercer University and uh, looking forward to, uh, to that conversation in and around talking about uh, Dr. King. We'll be at Rankin Chapel in, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, at uh, the great Howard University, Dean, uh, Dean Richardson. Uh, dean Bernard Richardson is the dean, uh, dean there. And we're doing just quite a few virtual uh, events um, that are across... Uh, across the country. That's one of the beautiful things about uh, virtual that you can do these, these, do these events virtually. So that gives a little snapshot of just some of the places that uh, we'll be. And, and, and we'll be in, 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 in Chicago, of course, uh, on the fourth Sunday in Chicago, uh, our good friend, uh, now uh, Reverend Dr. Senator Raphael Warnock will be presenting. And uh, he'll actually, I'll be doing a book signing. He's going to interview me. I'm going to interview him. And then we're going to do a book signing right afterwards. Um, because we were both at Morehouse at the same time, and we've been friends for years, and we're, we're looking forward to that, uh, that conversation. Well, all of that sounds wonderful. And, um, you know, whether we can get Dr. Moss at General Senate this year or not, I don't know yet, because he has some plans. Um, start praying, and maybe we will get it. But even if we don't, we will certainly have his books available as well. And for those of you who have done this with me before, you know when I get excited about a book, I wanna share that excitement. So I'm going to ask Jennifer, who manages our behind the scenes of our webinars, to put her email in the chat. Pay attention to what I'm saying. Jennifer is placing her email in the chat. And the first 50 people to email Jennifer with your name and your, and your uh, mailing address and just write, I was here, will receive a free complimentary copy of Dancing in the Darkness. The United Church of Christ wants to support this work. Don't put your address in the chat. You're not listening. <laughs> email the address to Jennifer at her email address that's in the chat, whiteje at ucc.org. Send your address and you will receive a complimentary copy of this book, not just because I wanna support Dr. Moss, but because I want you to have it. I want you to have it in your hands. And don't let that stop you from buying one. Amen. <laughs> you can buy Amen. one and give it to someone else and you'll have your copy from here. Dr. Moss, I'm so grateful for your time today. And I know that you've been back to back during these interviews, but we just had to have you uh, come and talk with our audience here today. And we are so very grateful. I want to close with one final question to you. What gives you hope mm. in this current situation? 
What gives me hope is uh, the magnificent creativity that I'm witnessing among a new generation of artists and poets, uh, painters and creatives uh, who are drawn from a, a deep uh, spiritual well. Um, poets such as an Eve Hewing and a Joshua uh, Bennett, uh, the incredible work that, uh, that they're doing, uh, academic and then also artistic and then being activists. Uh, the amazing uh, artistic work of, of a young lady by the name of No Name from, from Chicago. She's, she's, she's a hip hop artist and uh, she is raising questions in and around uh, patriarchy and its intersection with racism. Uh, and, and it's just a really powerful thing to see a, a young sister who is using uh, the, the power of her art and her voice uh, to communicate. She has a song that's called Casket Pretty that is so moving uh, that why do we want to create uh, uh, pretty caskets for, for our dead children? And it, it's a really powerful piece to, uh, to, to witness. So that, uh, that gives me hope. It gives me hope every time I look at my children um, and uh, witness what this generation is is attempting to do as many of them are going back uh, to the sources of of their strength and tradition and spirit uh, in a very unique in a very unique way and wonderful musicians <laughs> are giving me uh, giving me life and and giving me hope so so my, my musical recommendation there's a young man by the name of Corey Henry he yeah. plays the Hammond B3 organ. And he was raised in a Pentecostal household. And uh, he connected with some guys from the University of North Texas and joined a group called Snarky Puppy. And he ended up playing as their, uh, their organist. And he is a gift. He has some stuff on YouTube that will just, it's ridiculous for someone to be this gifted uh, in their musical ability. We, we had him at Trinity one time before anybody knew who he was. And uh, he's a musician's musician. And, and, and to see someone who has this deep uh, appreciation for the spirit, deep love for music around the world, um, and has some great music just to vibe to, especially if you're writing, um, whether it's a sermon or a book or a poem, uh, he, he's got some, he's got some good stuff, uh, that elevates what, uh, what he learned as a child. Well, there are many people in this, in the chat who are saying that you have given them hope today. Mm -hmm. And so I am very grateful. Uh, I want you to know, and you have met my mom. She does not come down for my interviews often, but she's sitting here because she had to hear Otis Moss. So <laughs> Mom Blackman, we're we so delighted. I wish I could give you a hug. I would right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we are so grateful to have this time with you. And again, the book is Dancing in the Darkness. I am asking you, even if you get a free one, to buy the book because we want it to reach the New York Times bestseller list. Mm. We can do this. We can do this. Uh, we have many good programs coming up for you. We're getting ready for Senate. We hope that you will join us in Indianapolis for General Senate this year. We have some surprise speakers coming there as well as the phenomenal ones that have been listed. Uh, and we will have a writer's corner there as well so that you can hear from many more writers the quality of a Dr. Otis Moss III. Bless you, my brother. And if you don't mind, if you would give us our benediction, mm. we will be on our way. All right. Again, thank you so much, uh, Tracy. We just so appreciate you and love you. And uh, let's... Wait, let's I have to ahead. tell you this. This professor says, bought the book during the webinar. We'll be using the webinar and recommending the book in my spring course at Fordham University. Wow. Wow. Thank Hill you. Fletcher. Oh, my goodness. Thank you yeah. so very much. Wow. Wow. That, that is, that is a blessing. This has just been a blessing to be on here uh, this, this, this afternoon. So let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We come to you with open hearts. We come to you with a need. 
We come with gratitude and we come with questions. May your spirit fill us and may the Ruah, the exhale, the breath of your very body rest on us. May we be brave enough to inhale what you exhale and may it fill us in such a way that we may punch holes in the darkness, that we may dance in the dark, and that our mourning may turn into dancing, and that we might have a shout when the sun rises. Mm. Bless the work of all those who are on this webinar and touch the families that we come in contact with. And may we always learn not to take ourselves so seriously and always to give you give you thanks. We offer this prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you travel, Dr. Moss, and we are so grateful for you. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Siblings in Christ, if this conversation has moved you, if what's been offered here has helped enhance your ministry or your soul, please consider donating towards the annual fund of the United Church of Christ by texting UCC to 41444. Your support will help programs like this in the essential work of the United Church of Christ. Thank you for your support. Be blessed as you continue your day. Know that you are not alone and we are holding you in prayer. Amen. <laughs>